Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction Jim. Um, without further ado, I'll go into my talk this evening, which is all about how we actually interact with technology. And I'm going to take you through a number of technological breakthroughs that will hopefully demonstrate the future of how we actually uh, interact with technology. And then leave us with a bit of a profound question at the end is, is this actually evolution or is it devolution? So, let's begin. Uh, 1965, Spain. Um, a Dr. Jose Delgado, um, a neuroscientist who was claiming that he would be able to manipulate the brain function of a bull using electrical charge. Um, so what he did, fixed on a rather cumbersome, as you can imagine, it's 1965, a rather cumbersome bit of kit strapped on top of a bull's head with two electrodes going into the area of a bull's brain that control aggression and movement. Um, then in his hand, what can only be described as Del Boy's mobile phone, again it's 1965, this massive wireless controller that when pressed the button, it actually sent a small electrical charge into a bull's brain. Just to show um, that indeed, uh, much like we all believe that a bull is perhaps one of the most ferocious and aggressive animals in the animal kingdom, just to show that the bull uh, taking part in this experiment was a very, very angry bull, um, they put a conventional matador in the bull ring. And there he was doing his usual gubbins with the red rag, taunting the bull. There it was, running back and forth, acting very aggressively. Then, foolishly, um, some would say, um, a belief in science, some would say, Dr. Delgado got into the bull ring as well. And what he was able to do with this wireless transmitter was, again, taunt the bull. It starts running towards him. He presses the button, which sends this electrical charge, it wirelessly again, into the bull's brain. And all of a sudden, the bull just stops dead. And I don't mean dead as in eh, eh, brown bread on the floor, I mean as in completely docile and um, running around in a circle, so certainly not running forward in a, a mad aggressive charge. Hence, proving that everything that we do as biological entities, as humans, is actually controlled by uh, a combination of electrical signals and chemical reactions. So, we set the scene there. We move on 30, 35 years in present day. A very similar experiment was taking place. And this, in this case, it was actually done with a rat. As you can imagine, in modern day, the, 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 the electrical uh, components affixed on the rat's uh, head or back, as it, the case may be, were somewhat miniaturized. But again, using electrodes via invasive surgery placed into the actual rat's brain, um, they were able to conduct a rather interesting experiment. The electrodes were actually placed in the, the area of the rat's brain that controlled its whiskers and also another electrode into the area of the brain that controls pleasure. And what they were able to do wirelessly via a laptop, say for instance they were pressing the left key on this laptop, that would stimulate the rat's left whiskers. The rat would then, it had a choice I hasten to add, if it turned left after having its left whiskers stimulated, would be rewarded with an electrical charge into the pleasure center of its brain. You repeat the process with the right hand side, uh, whiskers, and what have you got? <coughs> Essentially, you've got a remote-controlled rat. Again, all completely wireless. So, we move further down, and again, this is more recent times. Sorry if I keep going in and out there. Um, it's my uh, inexperience with the microphone. Um, and what we have is a somewhat controversial experiment conducted with a monkey. As I've already alluded to, everything that we are as a human being, everything we are from movement to thoughts to feelings, it's just a combination of electrical signals and chemical reactions. And there was a chap, I believe his name was Dr. John Chapin, he reckoned he had decoded all of the electrical signals that make up the movement of a monkey's arm. And how was he going to prove this? Well, again, putting electrodes into the movement centre of the monkey's brain, hooking this up to a computer and then a robotic arm, they proceeded, and this is where the controversy, as well as the invasive brain surgery, comes into play, um, they fastened the monkey's arms behind its back. And then the monkey, via thought, via the same way it would use its own hand, hooked up to this robotic arm, was actually able to feed itself. So we're talking a bionic, thought-controlled limb. So building upon Dr. Delgado's research, building upon the research with what we saw uh, in the previous slide with the rat, we now have got a thought-controlled bionic limb, which I'm sure you all agree is pretty darn impressive. So, we move into um, uh, only five days ago. I did have another example of, uh, of human bionic limbs, but um, I came across an article in the Daily Mail, 
uh, as I say, five days ago. And basically, there's a small girl, I believe her name was Tilly, apologies if I get that wrong, and unfortunately, she'd had both her arms amputated at a very, very early age. So what they were able to do via this very, very handsome piece of technology called the iLim, which is incidentally produced by a UK company called Touch Bionics. Again, using thought, using the electrical signals that control the movement of her arms with some strategically placed sensors on her arm, this little girl is now able to pick up balls. I saw some film and footage of her actually painting. So again, actually interacting and interfacing with technology, with in, the, in the, the, this particular case here, a bionic limb, and controlling via thought. So, um, I'm not sure if any of you are aware or have actually heard of this, there's a, an unfortunate condition called locked-in syndrome. And what locked-in syndrome is, is basically where you are completely aware of your whole surroundings, um, um, you can take in information, you have lots of inputs, to use an engineering term, but you have no outputs, i.e. you can't move, you can't talk. Some of the, the, the um, uh, and I, I use this uh, for want of a better phrase, some of the luckier locked-in syndrome patients are able to blink to communicate, but some of them are unable to even do that. And what happened was there was a young guy in the United States of America, fully mobile, didn't uh, have locked-in syndrome at the time, and was involved in an unfortunate car crash. As a result of this, he was paralysed from the neck down completely unable to convey what his feelings were, what he required from his parents, etc. Um, he, however, was able to communicate by blinking. So it wasn't a case of, right, um, he's perhaps in a vegetative state. They knew he was still uh, had some active brain activity going on. So what they did, again, via some initial invasive brain surgery, was put some electrodes into the speech centre of this young guy's brain. And what they got him to do over a period of months, and I uh, hasten to add this research is actually still being conducted today, they got him to start thinking the composite parts, the building blocks of the human language. So the E's, the O's, the R noises, that we all hear babies say day to day. So not necessarily words or sentences, just as the, the building blocks of the human language. And then recording these electrical signals. And as they move forward with this actual research, recording all of these electrical signals of the building blocks, then moving on to words, then moving on to sentences, the intention for, for this young guy is that he will be able to speak via thought. We're talking a thought-controlled speech synthesizer. Um, I've recently read, when I was just checking my facts before I got on stage uh, today, um, I discovered that they've actually pioneered a non-invasive version of this technology. So a, a web, a lattice, if you will, a bit like an EEG cap. Um, uh, and again, teaching uh, uh, and asking uh, the, the participant to think of certain words, recording the electrical signal, and then from there, moving on to actually having a speech synthesizer controlled via thought. So, this chap here, um, he works for Toyota, um, and uh, you may have uh, come across um, the Honda SEMO, Toyota, Honda, Mitsubishi, perhaps more widely known as motor or um, uh, motorcycle manufacturers. They always have very extensive research and development facilities for investing into general technology. And what we have here is a thought-controlled wheelchair. You'll see the EEG cap on his head, again, totally non-invasive, this can be put upon his head, um, and this chap is able to control his wheelchair, again, I hasten to add he's not actually disabled, he's one of the researchers, and he's able to control this wheelchair by just thinking in the direction he would like to travel. Start, stop, left, right, he's able to do all of this via thought. I mean, granted, at the moment, perhaps this looks like a, a bit of a, a cumbersome piece of equipment, but as I'm sure we're all aware, um, technology uh, is always being miniaturised, things are always getting smaller, unfortunately perhaps for the sustainability of things, I thought I'd give you a little nod there, because um, I did uh, very much uh, have a, a, a deep understanding and uh, uh, agreed with what you were talking about earlier, but this miniaturisation will certainly occur um, where you will be able to have a thought control wheelchair commercially available to the market. So. What we have here is what I call commercially available brain-machine interface technology. This item here is called the Mattel Mindflex, and the Mattel Mindflex is available today on Amazon for $60. This was actually released last year. I have no idea why these haven't been a hot seller, why they literally haven't been flying off the shelves. I mean, if I wasn't a poor entrepreneur, I would certainly have bought one. Uh, and let me just take a bit of time and explain what goes on here. 
You see this purple ball? It's a very lightweight, very porous ball. And what it's able to do is levitate on a small airstream here. And then what you do with this central knob is navigate the airstream and the ball around this 3D assault course. Well, how do you do that? Because they're all different levels, different heights, etc. Well, using this, again, non-invasive EEG headset, when you concentrate, the air jet gets more intense and the ball raises higher. When you relax, relax your mind, the ball goes lower. So a combination of turning the knob and concentrating and relaxing allows you to navigate this ball through this 3D assault course. Again, you can buy this today for $60. I have no idea why this isn't more popular. I have no idea why this isn't on national news, hence why I'm here this evening. Um, what we have here, and those of you with a keener eye um, will realise that that's a 3D computer-generated image of a product called the Epoch 2 headset. And the Epoch 2 headset is produced by a company in Japan by, called, by the name of Emotive. And what you're able to do here with these various sensors, again, non-invasive, what you're able to do is manipulate and play very, very simple and rudimentary PlayStation 1 games with your mind. I do not jest, this is fact. And what they're also doing at the moment, um, some research and having a lot of joy, is using this Epoch 2 headset with disabled people who aren't necessarily able to use conventional IT equipment, and they are able to open and close windows, start a program, exit a program, run a program, etc. Again, this is in its early stages, but just imagine, we know the way things can move forward very, very quickly in the technology sector. Imagine what this is going to be like in 10 years' time. And again, these are available today. $60, a somewhat higher price of $300, but still fairly commercially accessible. So, and this is where it gets a little bit scary. Um, for those of you who are avid TED Talk watchers, you may have come across a TED Talk by uh, uh, Henry Markham. And Henry Markham, much like the Human Genome Project, is actually busy decoding the human brain. So in the case of the Human Genome, decoding the double helix of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, um, I won't do, try and do the full components of that. Um, and what he's doing is decoding all of the electrical signals that make up memory, thought, everything that we are essentially as human beings, and simulating it in a rather large IBM supercomputer. And he's been reported in saying that in 20 years' time, and I, I say 20 because I'm giving the guy a bit of leeway, because he actually said 10 to 20, which I think is quite a big threshold. He's saying that in 20 years' time, you will be able to download yourself into a hard drive. You, who you are, your memories, your thoughts. So basically decoding all of those electrical signals that make up what it is to be human. But then this is where the profound question comes into play. If everything that we are as a person can be broken down into electrical signals, how do you know what's real and what's not? How do you know that in that transfer process someone hasn't added or taken away a memory? Where does that leave us as human beings? Is that evolution or is it devolution? And then, of course, there's the question. If people are somewhat bored of our, what we call a corporeal body, and what I mean by that is it's, it's, a, it's a body, it's an existence based upon matter, biological flesh. If you're able to use this technology and download yourself perhaps into what can be arguably one of the, the greatest storage devices in the entire world, the internet, who's to say that we wouldn't experience some sort of other devolution. So, we're brought back to the original question. Is this evolution in terms of how we interact with technology? Is it devolution? Does it make us question what it actually means to be human? And then going back to that little example I gave there with regards to the internet and some people deciding to shed their bodies and perhaps become a bit more of an informationally based being. Perhaps we could have some element of political devolution. You get enough people downloading themselves into the internet and all of a sudden, forget the USA, you've got the USI, the United States of America. Political devolution, a free independent state based in the internet. Well, that was it. That was my talk, evolution or devolution. A somewhat profound look on uh, emerging and breakthrough technologies. And I'll leave you with that question this evening. Is it evolution or is it devolution? Thank you.